You're listening to From the Midlands, the stories of people making a difference across the region. Our presenter is Gail Downey. Joining us on From the Midlands is Guy Shanchi from Bambino Mio here in Northamptonshire, the largest reusable nappy brand in the world. Hello and welcome, Guy. Hi. Now, you started your company more than 25 years ago, and it was with an environmental bend as well as a business, wasn't it? Tell me a bit more about it. That's right. I mean, we started selling reusable nappies in the 90s, and I think everybody thought we were mad setting up a company at that time. Everybody was using disposable products. But we had a real belief, and and, and reusable nappies had had lots of um, important reasons why people should, should use them. And it's not just about the sustainability angle, although a third of waste that's going to landfill is disposable nappies. 1% of the world's plastic goes into making disposable nappies and the facts go on and on and on as to why from an environmental point of view disposables are disposable nappies are a complete disaster but also it's the money saving um, pe- parents can save a substantial amount of money by using reusable nappies and of course because it's a reusable product they'll go on to save more money with a second child um, babies come out of reusable nappies a lot sooner than they come out of disposable nappies sometimes a year a year and a half sooner parents will potty train in in reusable nappies. There's a number of angles to to why we had a real belief in this product and our our mission statement when we started and still is to make reusable nappies commercially and socially acceptable worldwide. And it seemed an uphill struggle in the 90s. Reusable nappies really meant a pile of old-fashioned terry nappies um, collecting dust in the corner of a small baby shop. How have you been able to, or have you been able to, change that stigma? Well, I think the products themselves are really important. The products have moved on considerably. When, when people talk about, some people often use the phrase about going back to using reusable nappies. I always think about it going forward, that the, 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 the age of sort of um, the throwaway society, as we know, is, is, is moving away from us and quite rightly at a, at a rapid rate. So actually the, the, the reusable nappies that people now move into are as easy to use as disposables, uh, they use modern fabrics, um, Velcro to seal, um, very absorbent, easy to use, and certainly with our products, beautiful prints and patterns that, that, that parents seem to like. So part of it is about the ease of use of the nappies, but it's making sure that parents have access to, to all the products that go with it. So everything from the sanitizer that you can, that you can wash the nappies in to kill the bacteria, the, the nappy liners, uh, to pick up all the messy stuff so that doesn't go in the in the washing machine through to parents will use a nappy bucket to store the nappies although there's no sort of soaking or, or anything like that anymore nest that is necessary and then washable training pants and swim nappies we all know the disposable versions the little swimmers the pull-ups well many many parents see even more than, than would actually maybe do the, the whole reusable nappy thing would would use reusable training pants or or, or reusable swim nappies because Again, saving a huge amount of money and not throwing away a single-use product. A lot of what we invest time in is within the marketing, and what I mean by that is is communicating it to parents as to how easy it is. At the end of the day, disposables are um, an essential part for some some parents, and, and there are times when 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 disposables are essential for parents. But actually, there is a misconception that that disposables are necessary and that reusables are really difficult or really expensive. We've identified sort of the barriers that they are that there are there, and actually we can see that once parents have it explained to them about how easy the product is to use, the money saving that's involved, and actually all the benefits, parents who use reusable nappies all the time have don't see those issues. It's 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 just part of the routine, and 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 there are no issues. But obviously, disposable nappies are incredibly profitable for some very big companies, and it's in their interest to market market a different message. So in terms of how have we tackled this, a lot of it is involved in, in how we work through through social media, through bloggers and influencers, through our website, through email, to help parents on their journey, because almost on a daily basis, there are more and more people coming to this category because they want to use reusable nappies and not disposables. So... You're changing people's perceptions, you're changing the mind of parents and, and people who, who care for, uh, for young children. 
And how successful do you think you've been here in the UK? And how and are you more successful? Because you, you export to 50 countries, don't you? We see good growth. I mean, from those small beginnings in the, in, in the 90s where uh, we were selling by mail order, it was pre-internet days, it was sending out a brochure and people would send a, a check, if you remember what one of those is, and we would send the product out. We then grew that into independence. And, and nowadays you find our products in, in sort of all supermarkets, mainstream stores, everywhere you'd expect to buy baby products. Um, so the UK is, is, is a really important market for us. But as you say, we do export a lot. In excess of 60% of our sales last year were overseas, of which 50% was into Europe. And Germany is, is our biggest market outside the UK. And may this year actually um, overtake the UK in terms, of, in terms of turnover. And again, in Germany, you'll find our, our products in the main pharmacies, in, in some of the supermarkets, and, and again, the mainstream stores where you would have find baby products, as well as online in Amazon, our own website. We have 10 local websites around the world for country specific as well as a, as a global site and as well as independent baby stores in those countries. So Germany is our biggest market, but we're seeing good growth in France, in Portugal, Spain, other parts of Western Europe and Australia. And I think from sort of really feeling it was, a, it was an uphill battle in those first few years, the world has really caught up with this, certainly in the last, in the last two to three years. Single use plastics is firmly on the agenda. We've always struggled with the nappy issue, whereas it's easier to have those conversations or governments to have those conversations around throwaway supermarket bags and coffee cups and stirrers. Nappies is far more emotive. I can imagine that if you're a parent, that actually disposable nappy seems so much easier, doesn't it? Yes, and I think for politicians or policy makers or people who are campaigning in this area, they don't want to be telling parents at a sort of fairly stressful point in their lives what they should and shouldn't be doing. But there are ways of doing it, and we haven't either as, as a company or as, or as an industry really argued that, that we should be banning this as a product. It's about education, because actually, if parents can see the benefits of reusables, and there's a much greater awareness now of the damage that, that single-use plastics are doing and products like disposable nappies. You're very passionate about it. Yes. <laughs> and you actually became involved in a small Pacific island... I'll try and pronounce it, Vanuatu? Vanuatu. Vanuatu. And tell us about that and tell us how you helped government there reconsider their views on disposable nappies. So Vanuatu, for those who don't know, is a, is a, is a group of islands off the east coast of Australia. It's about an hour and a half's flight from, from Brisbane. Like a lot of Pacific islands who are the countries that are, gonna, that are being most affected by climate change, they're very forward thinking in terms of environment. And they did some work a couple of years ago on, on single-use plastics. And actually, they did announce a ban on disposable nappies as part of that. 27% of the waste in Vanuatu is disposable nappies. In countries like Vanuatu, we, you, and especially on some of the remote islands, you don't have municipal waste collections. You don't have the, the bin lorry turning up every week or two weeks to pick up your, your waste. There's one waste site in, in Port Vila, the, cap, the capital. But apart from that, there is anywhere. So what parents tend to do is is bury the nappies in the sand on the beaches and they get washed out to sea. That sounds really grim. It is, and that, but actually what, they're, what, what the parents are saying is, is it gets rid of the nappies, it takes it out to sea without sort of necessarily realising the consequences. So the government announced a ban in Vanuatu on disposable nappies, which, despite the fact we haven't necessarily advocated a ban, I thought was, was interesting and, and obviously we wanted to get involved with, so contacted the government. There was a backlash. Um, as you might expect from some parents, because it hasn't been communicated to just to just announce this ban and it would come in in a few months' time. So, so they rode back on that. They banned a lot of single-use plastics, but the nappy the nappy ban was put on hold. But we we contacted, we put in, in touch with various organisations, including a wonderful cooperative, Mama's Life, who were producing a few reusable nappies and reusable sanitary ware locally on the island, and um, we were put in touch with them and have been over the last year have worked with them quite closely to help them in terms of providing resource and some finance. Initially for a project that, that allowed them to make a large number of samples and um, go out to the communities and get feedback. And we produced a report and a video that was produced recently where parents uh, throughout Vanuatu, and we chose different communities. In somewhere like Vanuatu, there is the capital, but, the, but there are places where there is no running water, there is no electricity, and actually, how do those communities deal with, um, with washing the nappies, even though probably 10, year, 10 or so years ago they didn't have disposables. So we ran this research 
in conjunction with Mum's Life and an agency in, in Vanuatu. And, and actually, parents proved that once it was explained to them, and this comes back to the education point, and they tried the product, 89% of the of, of parents were, were, were keen to use reusable nappies. So we've been able to present that to the government and the Department of Industry. And we are now continuing to work with Mummer's Life, not to produce Bambino Mia nappies, but to help them be able to make nappies locally. And not only does that sort of play at the heart of our, our mission, our purpose, to get more people to use reusable nappies, there isn't a huge amount of money in, in Vanuatu, so we're working with them and helping them design and produce a nappy that will be cost-effective and will work for, for the majority of, of, of the population in Vanuatu. So we're helping them develop that, helping them scale up, and actually... By producing the product locally, it provides employment largely for women when somebody's been employed for, for a certain period of time or pay for, for the education of the children. It's a brilliant project to be part of. I feel incredibly privileged that Bambino Mio is, a, is now of the size where we can help with those sort of projects. But the exciting thing for me in terms of what we're trying to do is that as a result of that project, we're now talking to other governments. So the Maldives, Fiji, other countries... Um, there's a project around the whole of the Pacific region in terms of encouraging reusable nappies. That helps with our purpose, our reason why Bambino Mio exists, to get more people to, to use reusable nappies. It's not, we're not selling Bambino Mio products in these, in these countries, but it, it's part of our purpose and why we exist. Okay, and how do you think that the work you've done there and the, the other countries that you're working in can be transferred to the UK to get policymakers here to try to encourage change? It's very interesting because um, I set up our trade organisation about 20 years ago, the Nappy Alliance, and we've campaigned with government in the UK to address the, the nappy issue. We know they should be addressing it in terms of wanting to get to zero single-use plastic by 2050 and all their environmental claims that they want to make. And actually, as, again, in the last two or three years, because single-use plastics are top of the political agenda, those conversations are easier. And the environment bill in the evening debate on that where there were probably 20 maybe 30 speakers in that four of them spoke about reusable nappies i think on this one the uk government is is slightly behind the curve there are countries that are addressing this better than than the uk and certainly when we talk to governments in in australia and in europe we can see how addressing the the disposable nappy issue fits very much with 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 general policy. And what's the percentage here in terms of disposable nappies filling landfill here? In terms of all waste, about three or four percent is disposable nappies, but obviously we do recycle quite a bit of, of waste. I don't mean nappies, we, in terms of our ge general waste, some of that is recycled. But a third of non-biodegradable waste that goes to landfill is disposable nappies, and science suggests that they, t they will take up to 500 years to, to, to break down. And you're throwing human waste into um, into landfill, which it was never designed to deal with. You set up the company 25, more than 25 years ago now, but you'd always been a bit of an entrepreneur, even when you were a child. <laughs> Tell me that story. If you speak to family, even from even from a young age, I'd sort of, I suppose I'd always had this idea. I suppose I was always destined to sort of run my own business. I, I sort of vaguely remember. I was quite young at the time. And I don't know when it would have been, seven, eight years old, organising a jumble sale for charity and going around, the, um, going around the village we lived in, having put notes through people's doors, collecting all sorts of jumble, filling our local village hall, um, put a little advert, a little note about jumble sale. Um, it was before car boot sales and things like that in the, in the, in the, uh, in the paper, in the local paper. And um, I remember walking with my father then about an hour before it was due to start and there was queues around the block for this, uh, for this jumble sale. Um, and that was sort of my first taste of entrepreneurship, if you, if you like. And um, there's other examples from 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 so my childhood you, and so teenage were you years. An annoying child in that way. Oh, probably as my <laughs> annoying adult as well. <laughs> so you did a business studies degree, and you then, because your father was a chartered accountant, you thought I'll train as a chartered accountant. I know when we spoke before the interview, you said you were probably the worst trainee <laughs> that uh, KPMG had ever had. So why was that? I did a business studies degree and I'd done a year out working for, for Marks and Spencers in management, which was a great experience. And then when I left, I still had this burning desire. I'd always wanted to run my own business, and I, but it was about finding something that I could be passionate about and believe in and, 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 and finding that opportunity. So finance had always, had always I suppose, been at, at, 
in the back of my mind, I understood finance. Um, and, and as you say, dad was a dad was a chartered accountant. It's a world I knew. So I'd always been told, and I think it's probably right, that if you get an accountancy qualification, you can't go wrong, especially if you go and run a, run a business. But I think very quickly I realised probably I hadn't got the patience to do that. I don't think they ever put me actually into any exams. I was there about a year and a half, and yeah, probably the worst accountancy training KPMG had ever had, and they didn't make any secret of the fact. So I think they were quite relieved when I turned round. Joe had been made redundant from, from Marks and Spencer's. Joe, your then girlfriend. Yeah, girl, girl. Wife, yeah. yeah. Joe had been, been made redundant. Um, I clearly wasn't going to have a career in accountancy. So we uh, we literally made the decision, and within within a month of within a few weeks of, of, of resigning from KPMG, we were we were in India, and 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 had a brilliant brilliant time. Nine months travelling around the world, um, but and at the same time sort of looking for business ideas and 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 the nappy thing kept rearing its head in the most bizarre places um giving us that idea so tell us how that came about so we were in india which was sort of the first country we went to on our travels and we were at the taj mahal one night seeing the full moon which was nice and just got talking to an american from new york who talked about diaper laundry services that had, that had done very well in the States in the 80s and then sort of disappeared. That was a sort of first suggestion about, about nappies, about diapers. And then a few weeks later, we were in Nepal and we were talking to some Canadians who, who then told a similar story about, about diaper laundry services in, in Canada. When we finally got to Australia and lived there for a while and got jobs, I was cutting grass for Sydney Council as, as the job I was, I was doing to, um, to bring in some money for our travels. And I saw nappy laundry service vans sort of shooting around in Sydney as and I was what out did cutting they do? the what So do? nappy laundry services basically deliver clean nappies each week and you collect the dirties, so it's a service to, to do that. Uh, we visited one in New Zealand that, as, we, as we went through New Zealand that had done very well and came back and started one of the first in the UK. They were in, there were quite a lot in the UK, sort of 30 or 40 small companies doing this at that time. It was an interesting business nappy laundry in that the, 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 there's lots of different skills that are required. Obviously, there's the, there's the transport of them. We contracted out the laundry. Um, it was never going to be a business that was going to be particularly scalable. But what it did do is gave us fantastic experience of the product. So because with a laundry service, if you don't get on with it, if you, if you, if you're not, if you don't like it, then, then, then you, you, you'll just stop the service. And we were seeing parents every single, every single day who were using the products and really got to learn about how the products worked, how they could be developed. And certainly in terms of the products that Joe then went on to create for Bambino Mio, a lot of that development came from the, the experience that we got from talking to parents. So when we ran that for a few years, we were getting asked more and more for people who just wanted to buy the products and wash them at home because a laundry service is going to cost the same as, as using disposables, so you're not getting the money saving. And actually, people were beginning to realise, well, it is quite easy to wash these things at home. So we closed the laundry service down and, and, and as you've said, in, in 1997, started Bambino Mia. The business initially, when you set it up, was doing very well, but then things changed didn't they in 2008 9 we sort of we sort of plateaued at a business as a, as a small business at a sort of 2 million turnover and then the recession hit us we were doing 50% export 50% uk business most of our export nearly all of our export business we were doing through distributors at that time we now go direct to market but in those days it was through distributors and our two key distributors in france and the us had issues with other products within their range and um, they had issues within their business and stopped ordering from us. So we lost literally overnight about a third of our turnover, which then became half of our turnover. It was a really tough time. We had to obviously make huge savings. We had to unfortunately make people redundant at that time, which was, which was very difficult. But we still had a real belief that this is what we wanted to do and the world would catch up with us. So we made some key strategic decisions. Digital was coming through really strongly at that point. Um, suddenly the people who'd been at school university were starting to have babies and they'd come through school and university use it being online and those people were then having babies so the che everyone obviously was moving to digital but in the baby market it happened quite quickly and quite dramatically we knew what we wanted but the technology was took a little time to catch up but so decent website uh, decent email working on social media with bloggers and influencers pr and bring all that together and it would hopefully drive what we were what we were trying to do and we certainly saw that in the uk market we were work, started to work more with supermarkets, the new designs and the prints. We did a lot of work on that. But I think the digital piece that worked in the UK then meant that we could go to some of our overseas export markets directly, speak to consumers directly, 
work with the retailers directly without without distributors in the middle and that was sort of a monumental change for the business so having done that first bit in the first sort of 10 15 years of the business of proving that we had a product that people wanted to buy we were then able to do the scalable bit so we've then subsequent to that by 2013-14 we were seeing sort of some quite quite dramatic dramatic growth then off the back of it which has continued to happen and it was fantastic last year to to be listed as in the Sunday Times fast track 100 fastest growing businesses in the UK. That's absolutely excellent that that you've got that far when there must have been moments when you thought "Mm, perhaps I should do something else. Yeah probably not go back to accountancy. (laughs) I think we were just so invested both metaphorically and literally in the business and we had a belief in it and we had really really strong foundations that actually yeah we just carried on. And you're on target now for 20 million turnover? For this year, yeah. This year, that's great. What is the most extravagant thing you've ever bought or you've ever bought to your family or yourself or you and your wife since the business has grown and obviously become very profitable and successful? That's an interesting question because I, I don't think we have gone out and been particularly extravagant because we have invested, we have reinvested. We don't have a lot of borrowing. I won't bore you with that story, but during that time when it was really difficult, like a lot of businesses, through the sort of 2000 to 2010, 2008, the banks had thrown everything at us that we could. And, and to be fair, that's what helped us grow. We had everything from invoice financing to overdrafts, everything the bank would, um, would throw at us. But of course, as soon as things took a downturn, which we couldn't have predicted the level at which that had happened, or that would happen, they were really, really difficult. And I think, having been through that, the one thing that I said and that we that we subsequently did was to remove any sort of debt from the business. And we've been able to grow the business at the fast rate that we have, really by, um, a lot of it has been, been reinvested. So the business has given us a really a, a good life. We go on nice holidays and and have a nice house and, 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 and all of those things. But actually, I can't pick out anything specific or we haven't specifically gone out because at the end of the day, a lot of the profit from which we have been able to generate goes back into the business to ensure that we can continue to grow. The business is stable, the business is financially stable and we're not reliant on a huge amount of borrowing to get there. A business built on, on solid foundations gives you the freedom, I think for, for us in our business, Gives, it gives us the freedom to go out and do what some would describe as our purpose-driven stuff, so the stuff that we're doing in Vanuatu. I mean, we have three strands to our mission. The sustainability piece, which is, I think, is obvious on the, on the, on the surface in terms of we provide a product that is sustainable and does, does help with sustainability, but that does run right through our business. So we, we talk with our suppliers about how they're looking at their supply chains with sustainability, and we look at lots of areas of the business. Um, where we can be as sustainable and continue to improve with that. And then our other strands being um, our campaigning for change, and I talked a bit about that in terms of the work we do with governments and the work that I do through the NAPI Alliance. And then the giving back, and the giving back partly is in places like Vanuatu, because that's part of our giving back giving back strategy, but we also work locally, so we have a fund with the Community Foundation in, in Northamptonshire that, that is specifically targeted at supporting organisations that support people on low incomes and, and tackle some of the, um, the poverty in the county. And you were awarded the MBE for Services for Business. Yes. Uh, was that a, a completely out of the blue? Uh, yes, completely. And it was, a, it was a real surprise. I remember getting the letter, which was around the November time. And I was quite pleased. But it, it was quite a basic letter, actually, because it's it's, it was in black and white. You sign and say, yeah, you accept it, and then you, you won't hear anything until the announcement on, on New Year's Eve or the day before New Year's Eve. And um, for all that time, Joe just thought it was somebody who was um, a friend having a joke. Oh, really? until it actually yeah <laughs> until it actually happened and I suppose in the back of my mind I was thinking maybe that's that's the case but no it was a, it was very humbling to get that it was a fantastic um recognition and I, w- I was very grateful for for getting it although you do spend your time sort of running into other people and you think oh, they're, 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 they should be getting sort of acknowledgement for stuff so uh, it was a massive surprise but a very nice surprise and when were you awarded that 2011 the future for Bambino Mio what is it and for you? For me, it's never, been, it's never been more exciting. There's never been more going on. I mean, we have between 90 and 100 people work here at Bambino Mio now. 
Um, it is a fantastic team. We have a fantastic culture here where everybody is working in the, um, in the same direction. What's exciting for me is I think that culture that, that we've created, I've always thought, well, as we grow bigger, some of that's going to get lost. You're not going to necessarily attract the same people who, who have that same view. But actually, it's completely the reverse because the culture is really strong here and we all have this purpose and, and, and I have a brilliant team who are all working in the same direction. That just attracts people who want to do the same thing and actually one or two people may come into the business and don't quite get that and they don't tend to stay because they're not tuned in in the same way. I think the most exciting thing for me in terms of the bigger picture is the way that disposable nappies and the nappy issue is now part of mainstream debate. So the government in the UK is running a new life cycle analysis on nappies which will hopefully facilitate more work in this area in terms of encouraging reusables. But the United Nations have just produced a report on single-use plastics that included nappies. There are projects going on throughout the world. And and I think for the first time, I really feel that on that large scale, that we've experienced the discussions around single-use plastics on on coffee mugs, on, on stirrers, on plastic bags. Nappies will be the next big thing. And I think... In terms of the way consumers are are changing, especially millennials who are having babies, you can see the sea change there. And I think nappies will be the next thing that we see in terms of that high-profile attack on on single-use plastics that do so much damage. Okay, Yana Shanchi from Bambino Mio here in Northampton. So thank you very much. Thank you. You've been listening to From the Midlands, a whirlwind production. If you've enjoyed listening and would like to sponsor this series of podcasts, details are available on our website at fromthemidlands.co.uk.